For Kruma Media's Policy, I'm Sashni Mudli. Author Bridget Hilton Barber joins me today to discuss her book, Student Comrade, Prisoner Spy. Tell us about your upbringing, your parents, and your initial journey to Rhodes University. I came from a liberal family. And not just liberal, they were also bohemian. I think they were quite influenced by 60s America. They played guitar, they drank wine, and um, they were, their, their political views were definitely left of centre in those days, which was an unusual thing for, for South Africa. Um, you know, in many respects we were a normal white middle class family, except for our political views and maybe their slightly risque lifestyle. We grew up in Craigle Park, which was a very plush suburb in Johannesburg. And I went to Craig Hall Primary and I went to Hyde Park High School. And then following a family tradition, we went, I went to Rhodes. My grandmother had been to Rhodes. My father had been to Rhodes. My mother, they'd met there. And so had both my brothers. So it was kind of assumed that I would go along as well. And so off I went. <laughs> Forced removal resulted in your first politicization. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that? That was something that lives with me till this day. I had just arrived on campus and I wasn't kind of sure where to place myself and somebody that I'd met, I think in lectures, came, came up to me and said, don't you want to join uh, you know, this group? And they were working alongside also a liberal, I think they were alongside the Black Sash, but it was a, the Land Committee, if I'm not mistaken, something like that. And we went out to witness a forced removal. Not so much witness it, but you know, the police and the army were moving people and I think the Black Sash and the Land Committee felt that they needed a presence just to see what was going on. And it was absolutely appalling because people had been moved from their ancestral home in the Eastern Cape and literally picked up in trucks, loaded onto the back, women and children with their meager possessions and dumped in the middle of nowhere. And I'll never forget because it was early winter and the bewilderment on people's faces when they, when they looked around this barren landscape. There were no toilets, there was no shelter. I think I say in the book they were like ants scurrying on a hot plate. It really was the most devastating thing to see. Of course I'd heard a little bit about forced removals, but when you actually see that it's people, that, that haunted me. Tell us about the National Union of South African Students why you joined and about some of the people that were part of the organization. Okay, NUSAS I joined, I think I had um, the, the right political sympathies. NUSAS uh, represented left-wing and liberal students on the English-speaking campuses. And I saw in NUSAS a potential political home. I agreed with their views, which were essentially anti-apartheid. And to my astonishment, when I went to the first NUSAS meeting, I think I'd been under the illusion that student leaders or the student body would be sort of well-dressed and clean-cut and well-spoken and to my amazement it was the most extraordinary array of, of, of different kinds of people that I'd seen. Um, fat people, thin people, nerds, geeks, lesbians, I mean it was just an extraordinary... I looked around it was almost like a carnival in a way but what, what defined it was the, 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 the curious curious minds of those students. They really were inquiring young people who, who had never felt, I don't think, politically at home anywhere. Certainly not at school, certainly uh, in no, uh, no other organization offered them that. So I just jumped in along with the rest of them. <laughs> what role did the security branch play in repressing student anti-apartheid activity? The student, the, the security police in Grahamstown were brutal. They were particularly intense in Grahamstown, I guess because it was a small student town, so it was easy to police. But we were subject as students to unbelievable harassment. Our cars were followed, our phones were tapped. Um, we had awful things like raids in the middle of the night. At three o'clock you'd be woken up um, by a bang, bang, bang on the door and there would be a whole posse of security police and they would come into the house and they would upturn your drawers, they would, they would rifle through the cupboards, they would go through your personal possessions, and then they would taunt you. Um, so they, I think they took on a particularly nasty flavor in Grahamstown. In your book, you write about the firebombing of anti-apartheid activist Kristen Bekela's home. Tell us about this incident and how it influenced your resolve. The firebombing of Kristen Bekela's home was the first apartheid atrocity I'd come across. I was 21 and 
it's had a long lasting and haunting effect on me, I think my whole life. As it had, I think, for many students who were part of that time. Basically what happened was Chris and Bekele was, uh, as you say, an anti-apartheid activist. He was working in the townships and he was known to be a target of the security police. And then one night we, got a, we were living in a commune um, just off campus and we got a telephone call from um, Chris saying that his house had been firebombed and that he needed help. Nobody was ever found guilty of it in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in, in, to which he testified many years later. But the security police had f thrown a firebomb into the house and it was a small tiny township house and his girlfriend Maseka was sleeping in the house at the time and she was, she later died of her, of, of, of her burns, she received 80% burn to her body and um, she died unfortunately and I it, it just haunted me. I, it was the first encounter with, with, with a real death, I guess. So the consequences of what we're doing were suddenly very stark. You were also friends with anti-apartheid activist Matthew Goniwe, who was murdered by the security police. How did his murder affect you? Matthew Goniwe's murder was the most terrible experience. Um, it was a turning point in the struggle, so I don't think he necessarily died in vain, but they were brutally, brutally assassinated. Again, like many um, Eastern Cape community leaders, he was known to be a target of the security police. He'd been detained, he'd been harassed, he'd been tortured, he'd lost his job, his wife had been harassed. And um, I met him through student politics. As students, we were able to provide, I guess, auxiliary services to our black comrades in the township, things like media pamphlets, posters, transport, um, help with telephones, picking up people from the airport, that sort of thing. So I met him in that context and he was one of the most inspiring men I'd ever met. He just was a clear thinker, he was compassionate, he always had time for youngsters. So, you know, in many ways I felt like this naive young white student with big eyes looking at my hero. But he never made you feel belittled. He, he always had time to sit and talk through issues. And he had an amazingly sophisticated grasp of, of the political situation. And he was doing phenomenal work in Craddock in developing street committees. And he got to know quite a few of us students and then invited us out to Craddock to do articles on the street committees and to see how his plan would unfold. So when he died, um, I was absolutely devastated, as many of us were, because the circumstances again were never that clear um, in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but we knew it was an extremely brutal death and it remains to this day, I think, one of apartheid's murkiest hours. You were detained without a trial. Why were you picked up and what was your detention like? I was detained in 1986 under the uh, state of emergency that was declared across the country which gave the Minister of Law and Order, then Louis Lechrangi, the, the wide-ranging powers to detain anybody for 14 days and then increase the detention at his will. And um, I was picked up for my involvement in NUSAS and in the end conscription campaign and also for my involvement in a, a community newspaper called the Gramstown Voice. And I kind of had a sense that it was going to happen because people around me started getting picked up I was working for a newspaper at the time and the security police basically got in through a back entrance and popped up behind my desk and waved this paper about and said, you are under arrest. And um, they didn't have to provide a reason, they could just wave a piece of paper around. My detention was surreal. I don't know what other word to describe it because on the one hand I was seen as the traitor of the white people. And on the other hand, I was a white person. So there was this incredibly strange sense between the warders and the, and the, the detainees because we were all ostensibly the same color and yet the political divisions couldn't have been wider. And initially, a lot of the, the warders and the, the everyday people in the, in the prisons were very hostile towards us. And as the time wore on, I was there for three months in total. As time wore on, I could see divisions happening within the, the, within the prison services, within the staff. And some people started to, uh, to feel that it was wrong, that we didn't know how long we were going to be there, and we didn't necessarily know why we were there. Um, I was held in solitary confinement for close on three weeks. 
in a tiny cell, it was minute, I could touch either side of the walls. I had one rectangular window above me where I couldn't really see anything. There was a toilet in the cell and that was it. I was let out half an hour in the morning to exercise, which involved running around a face brick yard, and again half an hour in the evenings. That was the toughest part. And, but I was prepared in a way, you know, we had an inkling that it was going to happen, so we were prepared. We knew that, we knew of certain things you should do. Ask for reading rights, ask for knitting rights of all things. I never in my wildest dreams imagined that I would ask for knitting rights in an apartheid prison. Um, so, we, so we had a sense of how we would cope. But the, the idea of a detention without trial, I think, was to try and break you down. As with a solitary confinement, it wasn't necessarily physical, but it, it was to prevent you doing any outside work, and also just to keep you away and, and wear you down. While in detention, you managed to scratch a slogan on a cupboard, Notes White Minority Margarine. Tell us a little about <laughs> this. Let me just say that the prison food was ghastly. And um, we were served dehydrated vegetables, which smelled terrible and tasted even worse. And we were given government bread, and with it, the strange white margarine. And I suppose being a wordsmith and being cheeky, um, I decided to write on the cup. I, I had a, mysteriously, I had a pin in my cigarette box at the time that I used to scratch graffiti on the cupboard wall and I wrote no to white minority margarine. I just thought it was very funny and um, I still think it's very funny. <laughs> Olivia Forsyth was one of your closest friends during your time at Rhodes. What sort of a person was she during this time? Olivia and I became very good friends very quickly. We came from the same um, place of birth, which is the northern, it was then the northern Transvaal. And I think that gave us a bit of a bond. And she was clever, she was funny, she was charming, she was, she was a good friend. She, she had a wonderful mind. I remember her, you know, being bright and, and, and we, we both studied journalism together. So we kind of, and we joined NewsAs together, so we kind of had this natural affiliation with each other and we became very, very good friends. What was your reaction when you found out that she was a spy for the apartheid government? I had just come out of detention, so to give a background I'd been sitting behind bars for three months and I hadn't really seen anybody, any colours, any life, anything. And within a few days of my release I was sat down by a friend and comrade, Ray Hartley, and who delivered the news that they had discovered that Olivia was a spy. And I remember feeling absolutely hollow, almost nothing, because I think it took me a long time for it to, 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 process, to, to process the information and to realize the implication. But in the moment that Ray told me Olivia is a spy, I, I felt absolutely nothing. I was just amazed. She wrote a book a while back giving her accounts of being a spy. Were you satisfied with her version and have you forgiven her for her betrayal? Olivia wrote a book called Agent 407 um, that came out last year and I read it. I found it dreary lacking in contrition and there were many parts in which I know she lied through her teeth and I, th I found it a very unsatisfactory explanation for her for her time. Obviously it didn't focus entirely on her gram sound days, it dealt with other experiences that she'd undergone but the, the experiences that pertain to gram sound and to myself I found them I found them in, in, insufficient and unsatisfactory. Um, do I forgive her I think in order to forgive somebody, they really have to ask for your forgiveness and hopefully then a dialogue can ensue. But in this case, I never felt that she A, had come clean or B, really asked for my forgiveness. So in the end, not really, no. You revisited the cell that you were kept in. Why did you decide to do this and what were your feelings returning to that place? I decided to go back to Fort Glamorgan, to that tiny little cell in East London. I think because I'd been quite deeply affected by my detention, I'd ended up with quite severe depression, what I refer to in, in my book as the black dogs, 
That's an expression coined by Winston Churchill, of all people. And I thought it would be useful for me to go back and maybe lay some demons to rest. And so it was during the, the first sitting of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that I applied to the prisons to, 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 to go back. At first they said no, and then I pushed it a little bit, and then they granted me permission to go and visit. And I did it as a media story, but I think the personal motive was really to go and look at that cell and try and exorcise those demons from my mind. And again, it was the most bizarre experience because of course by now the government had changed. The first thing that happened when I arrived at the prison was the warders were having a strike and they had a, a huge banner outside the prison and it was painted in the same logo that the end conscription campaign used to use, which was a big dove. And I found that incredibly strange. And then I went inside and I met the, the captain, the male and the female captain, and the female captain had been one of my warders. So that, and we both recognized each other. This was some 10 years later. And they were quite sorry about their role in, in, in our experience. They were at great pains to point out that they were just following orders. They were at great pains to point out that they were just the prison and that things had changed. And I'd geared myself up to going back to that tiny, hideous, awful little cell. But I was totally unprepared for the smell that hit me. When I walked through that, that main gate with the rattling of, of keys and the banging of metal doors, the first thing that hit me was the smell of dehydrated vegetables. So I was unnerved and when I went back into the cell, it was the, 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 the area that the, my cell had been in um, had been turned into a juvenile prison. So that again made me feel extra strange. It was sad, it was just really sad. I knew immediately which was my cell and I went in and I looked around and I felt deeply uncomfortable. I had an altercation with the warder. She showed me in and I heard what I thought was the ship's horn. And she said, oh no, that's the train hooter. And I said, no, no, it's the ship's horn. And she said, no, it's the train hooter. And I said, it's the ship's horn. I know, because I sat in the cell. And she said, no, no, well, I work here. And I actually screamed at her and stamped my foot. At which point, the male captain came in and he said to me, listen, darling, he put his hand on my, my shoulder and he said, you're not the first prisoner to come back. You won't be the last. A lot of people come back, interestingly enough, looking for the same sense of peace. And then he delivered this wonderful thing. He said, if I were you, I'd go straight to the nearest bottle store, buy a six pack, drive to a beach, find a friend and drink them. And that's what I did, <laughs> eventually. <laughs> Someone once said to you that you don't ever mention the struggle, that you don't talk about it. Why was that and why then did you decide to write this book? I think that people get on with their lives. That sounds like a simplistic answer, but I think everyday lives take over. People got married, they had children, they left the country or they stayed, they got careers and somehow the events of the past sort of disappeared. Mm -hmm. I think that people didn't talk, don't talk about it a lot because the trauma was great for many of us. And I also think that people just got on with their lives. But I had, I think, unprocessed trauma. And I had an incident, I, I don't want to talk about it now because I don't want to spoil it for the readers, but um, <clears throat> I had an incident in which I came across a, a really, well, I came across a car crash and it reminded me of something from those days. And I, I went into a state of absolute trauma around that and I realized that I hadn't processed, entirely processed my experience and that perhaps it was time to give it a voice. And that the depression and the trauma and the pain that I'd been living with actually could end if I wrote about it. And it was cathartic in the end, very much so. But it was a, it, there was a long time between it happening and me writing about it. Maybe you, need, maybe you need that wisdom of hindsight. Maybe you need it to be sufficiently far away that you can look at it and go, okay, that's really what happened. That was author Bridget Hilton Barber discussing her book, Student Comrade Prisoner Spy.